Hi, I'm Chuck DeVore. I'm the Chief National Initiatives Officer for the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and thank you for joining me today. We have an interesting conversation up with Steve Yates about the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. What exactly is the Chinese Communist Party, and how should we view it? Uh, how should we view their stewardship, their leadership of the People's Republic of China? Steve, thanks for joining me today. Uh, you're quite the China expert, and unlike most Americans, uh, you spent some time to learn languages, and uh, you're fluent in Mandarin, aren't you? Allegedly, I am lettered in degrees and speak the language. I, one of the degrees is in language and literature, so hopefully I know some of that. So That's excellent. So let's just jump right into this. Um, most Americans, when they think of government and they think of uh, you know, political parties, they think of uh, an entity that has some degree of competition. You know, you have to fight to get votes. You have to get the support of the people. Um, what is the nature of the Chinese Communist Party? In other words, uh, how do you become a member? And as you rise to the ranks, how does that happen? Is it at all democratic? Do the larger people, the massive Chinese, have anything to say about this? I think the closest analogy that people might understand from the movies and TV, hopefully not real life, would be a mafia, not a, a real political party. You enter this kind of an organization, you have to pledge undying loyalty in order to do so. You are initiated or recommended by someone who's already on the inside. Uh, and to get ahead, yes, you have to earn votes, but votes from whom? Not from the people you say you would represent, but from those within the organization who are basically acknowledging your credentials to hold an office or move up. So the only votes that count inside China are within the Chinese Communist Party itself. And as one succeeds in climbing that ladder, you have fewer and fewer people who are voting on you going forward, but you've reached the top of that food pyramid. Wow. So tell me about the paramount leader now, uh, Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. How did this guy get to where he is, and, and what is? are we now on his third five-year term? He is. This is the third five-year term of who knows how many terms. Uh, I guess whatever he believes comes in the next life is the only being that knows. Uh, but at this, at this stage, she, most people think of what we would talk about in the news as an unchecked leader. In other words, he has all the levers of power. He isn't really challenged. A lot of people who are experts on China politics would talk about rival factions or different power centers uh, needing to make concessions to, say, the military in order to balance against other parts of the political process. Uh, but at this point, he doesn't really face that many challenges, which is why he has this third term. He's made himself essential. How did he do that? Well, he didn't do it by education. He has a third grade education. Uh, he did it by the school of hard knocks, perhaps. He saw his family disadvantaged in the Cultural Revolution. Uh, he climbed up, clawing and scratching his way. He's been clever about how to organize within the party. Uh, he is someone who is known to advocate uh, maybe the way people think about Putin, uh, imagining the way things used to be and sees himself as a messianic leader, bringing his country and his party back to its glory days. Um, there's often comparisons with Mao Zedong. Uh, Mao was... Uh, perhaps one of the most murderous leaders in human history. I don't know that those are the standards one wants to right, aspire glory to. Right, days. It's like, really? <laughs> I mean, how many millions does he have to kill to it get into the pantheon? Drove the economy into the ground, destroyed the culture and civilization. Uh, but if you're just a mafia don, and it's all about controlling people, uh, Mao did keep control. Uh, did stabilize the country in a very perverse way of thinking about stabilizing a country. Uh, and she has done some of those similar things. The difference is she is a much wealthier, more powerful leader of a much more modern 
and consequential country than China was under under Mao Zedong. So what happens in China doesn't stay in China in any way, shape, or form. Now, uh, under under Mao, if he, there was some kind of a virus that was spreading around the country, it was mostly a closed off and isolated country. It wasn't going to affect the whole world. We are still in recovery from a virus that made its way out of China, I would argue deliberately. And uh, we, you had an economy that was not embedded into everyone's everyday life. Right. They had smelted their metal into all kinds of uh, farm ornaments or other kinds of manufacturing metals. Uh, and so they were coming from absolute poverty and destruction into the, into the modern world. She has been blessed by trillions of U.S. dollars being invested into China just countless technologies that have been transferred to China, and they've become the manufacturing platform for the world. So there's dependency relationships. And so if you are this mafia, Don, you have your layers of loyal foot soldiers in every direction, in every ministry. You have purged those who might investigate you, so no one dares investigate you. You have purged those who might organize or conspire to push you into early retirement so you are safe in your position. Right. Then you look out into the world and say, where are the, the roadblocks I might face? Uh, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there was a lot of international talk about sanctions that would be targeting Russian leaders and the Russian system of government. And China had to naturally think, well, what if this came at us? And so I see she, if people want to understand the nature of how Xi Jinping came to being who he is, just think of an effective junior high school bully, clever enough to, to network and climb ahead in the organization, uh, sophisticated enough in his interactions to run a major city like Shanghai right. uh, for a time, and now is basically a power politics major uh, on uh, dealing with other countries and his own people. So that's the best way I can come up with to try to sum up who he is and how he comes to power. And I think ultimately what people need to think about uh, is that this is a mafia. It's not Chinese culture and civilization. This is not some deep thinking philosophy that's ready to be shared with the world, that the world needs to be converted to. It's really opportunistic right. and power. So tell me, during the Cold War, we had this interesting specter. I guess it was especially prominent in the early days of the uh, Russian Revolution after 1917. You ended up with these international structures, the common turn, right? You had um, a, a philosophy based in the writings of Marx and Engels and, and to a certain degree, Lenin. Uh, and you had uh, international adherence. You had people, you know, intellectuals primarily, but you had people all over the world, uh, especially amidst the Great Depression, uh, that were thinking, hey, this is an alternative. This is a different way of organizing. Uh, this will lead to uh, better outcomes for humanity. Uh, and so you saw this phenomena throughout the Western world where people would uh, turn for the other side. They'd be traitors, right? They, they would uh, report uh, information. They'd serve as moles or spies within their government because they honestly believed or were deluded into thinking that somehow uh, the Soviet Union, as the you know the guardian of international communism, was somehow the vanguard for the proletariat. Right. Yeah. Um, China doesn't really have that. So so how is it that China? Uh, what what are the pathways that China either does? Uh, what has been called elite capture, and what exactly is that? Uh, how do they get people to essentially help them or work for them, given that they don't offer an alternative like the Soviet Union did as the guardian of Marxism, at least mm -hmm. the the alleged guardian of Marxism? Well, I think that it's definitely the case, as you described, uh, that there are elements of what the Communist Party through its United Front or other influence operations seeks to achieve that are very similar to what uh, the Soviet Union and just international communism tried to do in that, in that earlier historical period. Uh, the difference is, I think that they're, they're, they're not really offering people uh, 
advancement per se. They can sometimes help people get ahead in their companies if they can give them privileged access to the market. Uh, and then maybe they sort of have captured an elite officer in a corporation in the United States, and they'll then lobby our government for more accommodating public policy towards China in return. So there is that kind of give and take where people could be better off in their own self-interests. We unfortunately in this time and space seem to have a number of Americans and maybe others around the world that I worry do see some things that are tempting about the Chinese system. When I think liberty-loving Americans look at the Chinese system and they see uh, a frightening surveillance state, uh, one where the technologies of the internet and artificial intelligence are not used for entrepreneurial purposes, but are used for monitoring manipulation, control, and punishment of people. When they look at China and they see Basically, the theology of the COVID crackdowns taken to extremes, uh, I, when a lot of Americans would see those Shanghai lockdowns for longer than a month, people in some cases even welded shut into their apartments. Uh, unfortunately, there were some in the West that thought, hey, that's not a bad idea. These people don't, aren't, aren't capable of knowing, understanding, and following the truth. We need to use the science to impose order and control, and the world would be better for that. Uh, in fact, in the early times of, the, of the, co the COVID pandemic, a lot of people pointed to the China model as the right way of doing things, and a lot of the lockdown culture we got was from those earlier actions by the Communist Party. So in some ways, there is, I think, a one-for-one -one transference of authoritarianism uh, it, in some ways, is elitism that people don't want to admit they're practicing. Uh, it is classist, for sure, looking down against the unclean that have not taken in the indoctrination. Uh, and uh, just like the Communist Party, if you're not in right. sort of the, the uniparty or the ruling Borg, then you need to be punished or compelled to follow. And I, I, there's, there's a, I think, a scary authoritarian impulse that, uh, that runs, I would argue, through the left uh, that is inspired by what they see in elements of China. And I think one of the things that shocked me more than anything is the change in American political and policy discourse from the 80s and 90s when you had Republicans and Democrats that would stand shoulder to shoulder calling out the human rights abuses, the systemic abuses of the communist system in China. Uh, and in recent years, we had the absolute crushing of freedom in Hong Kong. And it was not sort of championed as something worthy of American diplomacy or American power to influence the situation. It just sort of happened. And you didn't see the left and the right joining in opposition to this. Talking again about elite capture and how it is that so many Americans, at least of high station or power, uh, seem to be, you know, wanting to have expanded trade or expanded access to Chinese markets. Um, as I recall, uh, at least 10 or 15 years ago, there was a study about uh, how China was able to effectively uh, lobby for uh, increased access to our markets by, for example, the Boeing Corporation mm -hmm. uh, and its expectation of being able to sell ultimately realized a lot of commercial aircraft to China and essentially turning over the extensive Boeing lobbying apparatus uh, on behalf of increased trade with China because, of course, they would benefit. Um, that's obviously an example of kind of a transactional enlightened self-interest. But let's talk for a little bit about perhaps the more crass or, or uh, uh, corrupt uh, methods uh, of Chinese uh, elite capture. Uh, I want you to talk about two different examples. Uh, there was the uh, case where you had the Harvard chemist that was accused of not disclosing the payments that he was getting, I think, from the 10,000 Talents program uh, from China, uh, essentially giving up uh, significant amounts or allegedly giving up significant amounts of intellectual property to China. And then you have the, the curious case of the Biden family uh, with uh, increased evidence that uh, amounts of money, per, perhaps exceeding several million dollars, had been transferred to various Biden family members, none of whom appeared to have any 
inclination to actually create a legitimate business or to provide anything of value uh, that you could tangible value anyway. Um, how, how, tell, tell me a little bit about those two instances and what they say about uh, China's uh, tactics in uh, their long-running, uh, I would say, aggression uh, yeah. toward America. Well, uh, so in one form of the influence operation, uh, there are some very basic and crass things that have been used for millennia uh, from just any spy versus spy tale, uh, where you seek to compromise a counterpart by uh, offering the promise of glory, intimacy, wealth, access, promotion, whatever it might be, or protection from someone that is feared more. Uh, so some kind of an alliance or support. Uh, but there's there are inducements that could be offered uh, that would get someone to do things they otherwise would consider to be unethical, immoral, or against the interests of their community. Uh, and so if you take uh, a research scientist or someone who's in a corporation that has access to privileged information, uh, maybe you give a little bit of money, but then they're ethically compromised. And at that point, you have the threat of disclosure that is used as pressure to get them to move, to find other information from other colleagues, or to have to speak out against maybe activities that are happening on campus that the Chinese Communist Party wouldn't want to happen, like they wouldn't want a, Ta a Tibetan independence or a Taiwan independence rally to take place on campus. Maybe they can use control over a professor or department head who has received these inducements to then have to speak out against those kinds of things. And it can range from what people would consider to be small ball to truly consequential things, like research on nuclear engineering or advanced physics or tracking the people who are in their program who might have uh, ties of affiliation to our military or to our intelligence services and things like that. So it could be human intelligence. It could be substantive disclosure. It could be commercial intelligence. And one thing that I think really separates the way the Chinese Communist Party has evolved in this relative to what the Soviet Union was in the Cold War is that China really has placed a high priority on commercial intelligence and private sector information. It doesn't have to be something that's classified in order to be valuable to them. Knowing a full scope picture of how to understand and manipulate Americans is what they're after. And, and under the current technological realities of artificial intelligence and data in clouds, they are uniquely positioned to, to take advantage of it. But that elite capture begins in a human-to-human -human level, and you can, you can compromise someone. You could target, as they do, ethnically Chinese people. And they try to assert that they are first and foremost ethnically Chinese. And the Communist Party, even though it's not an ethnicity and has no claim over the Chinese people, would suggest that they represent all of China. And these people should feel some heartstrings pulling about something that's good for the homeland. Maybe they still have family that's back there. And geez, it wouldn't be wouldn't it be sad if mom or a younger sibling missed an opportunity or missed a visit with the doctor or something else. So there are the mafia-like kind of promises of, I'd hate for you to slip on that banana peel kind of thing that could be used as part of that elite capture. But those tend to be transactional, as, as you described, but they could be aimed at things that are very strategic from time to time. And over the last three decades, there have been some big problems we've run into on that. And some of those people that have been compromised were, say, uh, working in congressional offices in the U.S. House of Representatives or the U.S. Senate. Uh, there have been people who worked in uh, cabinet agencies of the United States government that have been uh, rooted out. Uh, so that's an ongoing thing. Now, when you think of what is in the news today with the Biden family, frankly, I have to say I've, I, I've never seen anything like this even alleged against a, a president and a first family. And people might say, well, wait a minute. The Trump family sure had the whole fictional kitchen sink thrown at it, even compared to what was falsely alleged with very limited to no evidence against President Trump and his family. 
We have a documentary trail of financial contributions to the Biden family that a House Oversight Committee is just now beginning to pull together and disclose. Earlier in my career, if I had been found to have questionable interaction with an intelligence agent or an influence peddler from the Communist Party of China, I would lose my security clearance, be fired, possibly even tried. If they had found bank records that had small amounts of money coming from those people, definitely would have been criminal charges. We're talking about transfers of millions of dollars. Right. Uh, and that, that is breathtaking. Now, why would they do that? They don't give it away because they love someone. They don't give it away because they respect someone. They give it away because it can and will be used against them. And I can't draw the, the line between point A, here's where the inducement or compromising activity took place, and B, here's the action and response. But what I can say is that occasionally the Biden White House talks tough on China, but when it comes to actual policy results, right. they have not fundamentally changed what our trade relationship is with with China. They have not stopped the fentanyl flow of precursor chemicals. They have not really pressed for any meaningful accountability for COVID. Uh, they have not addressed other kinds of strategic encroachment, like this odd balloon, which is symbolic of a larger weakness and compromise of our society. Uh, and so if there are no policy results that show pushback, uh, then I think we can assume that there's a reason why after so many deaths and families damaged by COVID and fentanyl, so many jobs lost by unfair trade and the mercantilist policies practiced, uh, so much invested into provocative and unnecessary military technologies and assertiveness from China in recent years. It's just odd that an American administration wouldn't be pushing back in a noticeable right. way. Let's talk a little bit. You mentioned uh, COVID uh, a couple of times. Let's talk a little bit about now that it's been a few years uh, and we have the advantage of time. What exactly happened in insofar as setting aside whether or not the virus was intentionally leaked or leaked because of terribly sloppy uh, safety procedures, uh, even as uh, elements of the U.S. through Echo Health Alliance were actually underwriting the research into um, augmenting uh, these viruses um, to, to make them more deadly because, of course, th that research was banned in America, so let's outsource it to Wuhan. That, that makes a lot of sense to do gain of function in a uh, sloppily maintained lab. So if you, uh, s setting aside the intent, take us from the moment the virus began to be a problem, take us through the Chinese reaction within China versus what China was telling the world regarding international air travel, their interactions with the World Health Organization under the United Nations. Um, what does that look like to you? And then lastly, lastly, the messaging, in other words, you, you, again, you touched on it, uh, the claims of the efficacy of their actions and how that then was translated into most, not all, but most of the Western world. Yeah. Well, I remember uh, at the time I was uh, on a couple of different programs with Fox News that kept having breaking images of something very odd happening in Wuhan, China. And it looked like men in moon suits walking around uh, spraying streets that were completely vacant with what looked like a 1950s kind of pesticide ad. Uh, just this smoke billowing all over the place where they were trying to sanitize an area where some kind of an unexplained outbreak had happened. There was next to no information about what are they even trying to address. Is it, What kind of a virus is it? Uh, and how is it transmissible? These were conversations that were yet to come. Uh, and so 
there was clearly something that had happened there, and the initial Chinese government response was not to tell its public what was happening, but it was basically to make the immediate area shelter in place. And so they did the the first set of lockdowns of just people in Wuhan. And Wuhan is not a small city. There's just it has an enormous population. Uh, and so that was economically consequential, politically consequential. But when you live under the Chinese Communist Party of China and they tell you to stay inside, you go inside. And so they did. Uh, this lingered longer, as they might say. Uh, and we began to uh, get talk of their, that what it was. It was a, a, a new version of what had been SARS talked about in the past. Uh, and uh, the Chinese government was adamant that they don't have any evidence of it being transmitted by, you know, by air. Uh, but that sort of belied their earlier step of then why did you lock down the city? Why was there this social distancing and shutdown kind of an, an approach? So obviously, in retrospect, especially you can look back at early messaging and see that there's a problem. But first and foremost, people have to understand and always return to the core point. The Communist Party of China is a political warfare machine. It is, it is always using words and messaging to manipulate and control and deflect. Uh, and so immediately it began telling untruths to the World Health Organization. Now, the World Health Organization seems to have been pretty clearly compromised. A lot of United Nations organizations are compromised by China because they throw filthy lucre around and they get a majority vote in organizations that protects them from scrutiny, sanctions, or whatever else. And so China's word was taken at face value. But worse than that, probably some WHO experts were in on what some of this research was about and that this facility was not uh, conduct was not conducting things in a safe way. That's the other lesson that should be internalized by everyone. The, under the Communist Party of China, this is a country with no ethics, no quality control, no value to human life or human dignity. They don't mind losing a thousand or a million people here or there as long as they remain in control and things just hum along to the next note in the symphony. And so dangerous, unethical research, China's the place to go do that. I don't really go very deeply into what the actual origins are because I don't know that I will ever know or that we'll ever have verifiable evidence. I think the government there probably did a pretty hefty job of trying to destroy the evidentiary trail. Uh, a friend, John Moody, who's a former Fox News executive, wrote a book titled They Knew, comma, They Knew, dot, dot, dot. And his fictional thesis probably comes closest to the truth that there was a... Uh, uh, a struggling worker at a lab who uh, took one of the animals that probably wasn't meant to be taken and sold it to someone in the area who then made a soup out of it and the virus goes from there. Anyone who's been to a Chinese market or the Chinese countryside knows that wild and crazy things could be eaten and this is plausible. It's as plausible as any origin story, but how it got out and what became of it, in his book, he makes very, very clear that this was seen as a political opportunity. It was an opportunity to impose controls at home. It was an opportunity to engage in manipulation of the international system. It was an opportunity to attack the United States without being seen as attacking the United States. It didn't have to target the U.S., but getting out internationally while closing down domestic travel was a pretty clear signal that they knew they had something dangerous that they wanted to keep from their people for a time, and they didn't mind it going out to Italy and onward to Europe and over to the United States. Clarify that a little bit because, uh, again, it, it's been a little while. So while they were locking down at home, 
What were they saying to the WHO and to the rest of the world regarding international travel? Well, they very clearly were were encouraging and instructing foreigners to leave. Uh, domestic travel was completely shut down by trains, planes, and automobiles. You couldn't cross provincial borders right. in China without security checkpoints. Uh, and international travel was encouraged to get out. Uh, and so uh, people who had been in areas where they had clearly been infected uh, were permitted to leave. Uh, now, compare that with anyone who engages in business in China, where there might be some question about who you've talked to politically, uh, and you can actually be blocked uh, your, uh, from exiting China these days. It happens with scary frequency. So in a country where they'll stop people for political reasons from leaving, it was an affirmative decision to go ahead and let people out who they had very high confidence right. were going to spread a virus. So to purposefully, to, to just simplify it, they were trying to stop or slow the spread of the COVID-19 virus within the People's Republic of China, and at the same time trying to speed up or optimize the spread of the virus globally. Right. While telling the World Health Organization that we don't have, we think this came from an animal and we're not sure about human transmission. Is it by contact, by air? Uh, and so then they began with the masks and the six feet of social distancing, uh, shutdowns and all of that as mitigating policies, right. all of which, shocker of all shockers, is very debilitating to an economy. Uh, but also, if you practice that, as we learned, sadly, you can take two years out of an educational right. system in, in doing that, too. Right. Uh, you have social disruption and, important to them, too, you can take down a president who had huh. been the first in a generation to really challenge you. Political warfare, like you said. Let's change gears and talk about uh, another type of manipulation, another type of deception. Uh, I'm not sure whether you had a chance to see a couple of articles that I wrote uh, that looked at uh, China's energy efforts. And uh, what, what I was interested, uh, what, what led to these articles is that there's a general thesis, or at least it had been commonly assumed, that one of the things that keeps China from, let's say, attacking Taiwan and, and perhaps Japan and the Philippines is the fact that they have to import about 10 million barrels of oil a day. And most of that comes through the choke point at the Strait of Malacca uh, next to Singapore. And it would be very easy for America and its allies to shut that down and essentially starve China of its oil, uh, whereupon they would need to rely on their strategic petroleum reserve. Ironically, of course, they've topped it off with oil they've purchased from our own strategic petroleum reserve. <laughs> uh, we're not exactly sure how big it is, but a lot of people think it might be about a billion barrels. Um, if you look at 10 million barrels a day and how much they might be able to get from Russia, depending on how much they want to cut back their usage, you know, maybe it would last them 150, 200 days, right? And so a lot of experts think, well, why would they do this? Because we could cut them off. Well, I started to look into the numbers. And what you see, of course, is that China already burns about five times the amount of coal that we do here in America. And they have currently under construction or planned uh, the equivalent of the entire U.S. coal fleet right now. So they're going to go from five to six times uh, what we use here in America. And if you're concerned about carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gas emissions, which is a planetary issue, if that's what you believe, not a local pollution issue, although certainly dirty coal in China also has local pollution implications. But you, you start to look at, for example, the Chinese electric vehicle fleet mm -hmm. and the fact that they sell the majority of electric vehicles in the world within China. And you realize that China's electric grid is essentially coal-fired for the most part. So those EVs in China are coal-fired battery vehicles, right? Yes. That's, that's what they are. Yes. And so uh, you, you, you then look at, for example, their conversations with former Secretary of State, former Senator uh, John Kerry, right? Uh, oh, we have to cooperate. We're cooperating with China on green technology, and they're, they're our, our partner. Um, that's at least the impression that they want to, um, to provide. 
Well, I think what's going on, when you look at their cooperation with Russia, when you look at the money they're putting into expanding Russian pipelines that can deliver oil and gas to, to China from Russia, when you look at this effort to electrify large parts of the transportation grid, and then the last thing that was of note to me was the Energy Information Administration does country profiles. And I noticed that China is really going in big right now to something called coal liquefaction. Now, this is not a new technology. This is something that uh, was largely perfected in uh, pre-Nazi Germany in the 1920s and was used by the uh, regime under Hitler to significantly expand the production of fuels and high-quality lubricants made from German coal, which, mm. uh, you know, Germany doesn't have a lot of oil. And so, but, but China has a lot of coal, just like America. Now, the problem with coal li liquefaction, and I'll, I'll, I'll seek your, your, your feedback on this, is that if you are concerned about the environment, it's about double the carbon dioxide emissions of simply uh, pulling oil out of the ground and, and refining it. And so you see China going into, into coal liquefaction to make fuel and lubricants. You see them electrifying their grid with coal, electrifying, pardon me, the, the transportation infrastructure. This strikes me as a China that is preparing itself for energy independence in the event that they go to war with the United States and they get cut off. Have you, have you thought about this and how they, they present it, though, as a green initiative? Yeah. Now, no, I, th I think that is exactly on track, and it is something that they have been thinking about for a generation. Uh, I think that in 1996, there was the, the first direct election for president in Taiwan. Uh, a man named Li Donghui uh, was on the ballot. He was kind of an accidental president in that he was the vice president to Jiang, Jiang Chiang Kai-shek's younger uh, son. Uh, and um, he was born in the Japanese era of Taiwan. Uh, spoke Japanese fluently, spoke Taiwanese, spoke Mandarin with a heavy accent. So not the poster child for Chinese nationalism that the Nationalist Party typically was and that the Communist Party sort of saw as a potential subordinate or partner. Uh, and so he was seen as someone who might be more sympathetic to independence for Taiwan, closer to the United States, but even worse, he was close with the Japanese. And they were the biggest boogeyman in Communist Party lore. Uh, and so there were these provocative missile exercises they engaged and tried to intimidate the people of Taiwan during the time of that election. They ended up electing President Lee by a landslide, not a surprise in terms of looking at how the election played out. But essentially, the U.S. stood by Taiwan, sent uh, carrier battle groups to the area through the Taiwan Strait to, ex to show basically force and solidarity. And China at that time didn't have options, and they would have been cut off in a number of different ways. And I think from that point forward, they'd started before, but from that point forward, there was a very motivi motivated strategy of research to look at how could they forge these alternatives. I, I agree with all of the areas uh, you were talking about, and they weren't motivated by environmentalism or s using that as a, uh, a connecting tissue in the, in the propaganda at that time. It would come later, and it works brilliantly for them. The only piece that I would add on top of it is nuclear. They are also the fastest growing nuclear energy power on the planet, right. very far ahead in small modular reactors, something that we in America should be leading the way on. We know how to do it, but in our infinite wisdom or the lack thereof, we don't permit this kind of stuff right. in our country. And even if one does worship at the altar of climate change over all else, this modern nuclear energy, especially the small modular one, eliminates the possibilities of a of a of a, a Fukushima kind of uh, meltdown or uh, other kinds of problems. 
And so China is moving decidedly in the direction of energy independence. And I, I think it is 100% for the reason you suggest. It is not for the sake of the planet. It isn't because of brilliant economics. It is because it allows them to be sanction-proof and blockade-proof. So there's a, a, a concept in military deception operations. I'm a retired Army lieutenant colonel and an intelligence officer. And the, the concept is that a true deception plan to be successful has to be believable. You want to present something that your enemy wants to believe. And to me, that's one of the more interesting aspects of this, right, is that, oh, look at all the wind turbines and all the solar panels that China is putting up, even while they are building so many coal-fired power plants yeah. that it completely exceeds the current U.S. fleet, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it, yeah. it's like you have this right in front of your eyes, and yet people like John Kerry and the president, frankly, right, we, they talk about cooperation with China on, on this. Uh, what do you think the Chinese Communist Party leadership thinks when they view a U.S. administration saying, we want to work with the Chinese on climate change and on environmental uh, uh, energy? Well, it's music to their ears. Uh, and it's a lesson they've learned from previous generations. They learned that when the leader of the free world has something that he really, really wants. And if you can try to offer some assistance in that regard, then other issues can take a back seat. So when China's going through the great proletariat cultural revolution, something that no American of any common sense would have had sympathy for, China that was in a desperate situation in many different ways, uh, that they could offer a balance against the Soviet Union, then the leaderships learned if we engage in this policy of balancing the superpowers and lean towards the United States and we play what they want to hear about reform and opening. We know that we've, we've done bad things politically, but we're reforming and we want to modernize. We're going to open up. Americans love opening up. It sounds like a welcome for missionaries of theology and capitalism and all that's good and holy in the world. Uh, and if we say that we're we're going to have pragmatic relations with you and uh, and this will help balance against the Soviet Union and allow for your uh, withdrawal from the Vietnam War, all of this sounds like really important things that a, that a president at that time uh, is in search of. And when you start moving in that direction, all of a sudden we're not paying attention to the systematic human rights abuses, the, the atrocious economic system. Uh, the, the sins that they had committed in the not-so-distant past, uh, including the support for a regime in the Vietnam War that led to the death of a lot of Americans. Right. Uh, and so uh, they had that experience with Nixon. Uh, they had that experience also, unfortunately, with President Bush in the post 9 11 env environment. Right. If we have a leader of the free world saying that there is a threat greater than all others and it isn't China, right. then they've got something that will take the heat off of them on trade, on even a rogue power that is their ally like North Korea, uh, human rights belligerence towards Taiwan, all these things take a back seat when they find a president who says something else is a higher priority. At least they could see some of those things in power politics, military realities, national security. What I think they probably are laughing the hardest about now is that there is a fake religion that has overtaken the hive mind of our leadership elite. And the Chinese know that it isn't science-based. They know if it were science-based that all that coal burning would trouble, the, trouble the, the souls of these people. They know that it's they're blinded to realities, and so we just need to play with their toys and right. say their words, and then every other issue is less important. There's no way 
trade tariffs are going up against us if they need us right. for this global priority. There's no way they're going to do anything about genocide against the Uyghurs if they have this other priority. And sadly, even though President Biden has accidentally said he'll stand by the people of Taiwan, huh. uh, it's hard for the Chinese to believe if we have this counter messaging of climate change being our largest national right. security threat and cooperation with China is very important. It's soothing to them. We only have a few minutes left together. Let's explore uh, one last point, kind of taking us back to the beginning and the title of this uh, discussion about the threat from the CCP. Um, you might say, I mean, you've talked about the CCP as kind of being a mafia-like organization. Uh, they obviously exist to perpetuate themselves in power. To a certain degree, you must think they, they should be risk adverse. Uh, there is a certain line of assertion or propaganda that unlike the United States, which seems to go to war all over the world, that, well, China doesn't really have any uh, significant territorial uh, disputes with its neighbors or ambitions. Uh, but is that really true? If you look at for example, India, you look at the South China Sea with this farcical nine-dash line, you yep. look at threats against uh, Taiwan, you look at territorial disputes with Japan over the Senkaku Islands, um, uh, of course, using the Japanese name on purpose, yeah. uh, even uh, claims on Russian territory because they uh, certain parts of the Russian Far East had been uh, lightly administered by Chinese empires of the past. So uh, how does the Chinese Communist Party view this? Because if, if war and conflict is inherently dangerous and unstable, do they believe that they have to expand or die? Or is it simply that because other nations are a threat to them, they need to deal with those threats? I mean, how do, how do we reconcile uh, this seeming conundrum? Well, part of it, I think, is ideological for them, and it goes into their education system and political training that they, they all go through. Of uh, It's their version of Manifest Destiny, in a sense. Uh, this nine-dash line is truly a farce. It, it's something that's uh, uh, just magnificent to behold on a map that a country could make such claims. Uh, it is an offense to all of Southeast Asia, but one they feel powerless to do very much about. Uh, but... The Chinese elites and a lot of their society have been led to believe, well, China was kind of this great nation for thousands of years and was the center of the world. This is the, sort of their rightful place. And but for the evil Americans and others unfairly trying to contain them and hold them down, these are the areas that they would fish and that they would control. And these are the states that would be tributary states that would come and kiss the emperor's ring and pay tribute and live peacefully as as long as they were compliant and dutiful neighbors. And th this all seems very natural uh, in, in that counter narrative. Uh, that, but I think the, the greatest danger, while all of that is real in the territorial claims, and there is a military component to that that comes with risk, the Communist Party has found that a very open and naive world will allow them in to influence their countries without having to fire a shot and that they can co-opt and divide countries that they see as a challenge so that they get Hong Kongers working against Hong Kongers, Taiwanese working against Taiwanese, Americans working against Americans, and getting us all to erode confidence and effectiveness of our own institutions. And if you think of the loss of confidence that Americans might have in their government for feeling like they were misled during the pandemic, a loss of confidence Americans might have because they question the fidelity and effectiveness or uh, integrity of their election process. If they begin to question whether their elected leaders are telling them the truth or parroting the talking points of a foreign government or foreign influence that's bought off their family, then you've really taken down American greatness without having to fire a shot. Uh, and if we keep going in the cultural direction we are going, uh, then China doesn't have to overtake us. We pull ourselves down, and they are by default the alternative. Uh, and so they don't have to say that they're a superior system that delivers superior results for other countries. They just have to be not that burning 
fire over there that is America. Uh, and that's what they've been going for in their political warfare. Unfortunately, they've been pretty good about supporting, encouraging, and amplifying uh, voices that are anti-American. Uh, there's no doubt that the New York Times project that was questioning the foundations of our country was something that the Central Party School in Beijing had to be thrilled about. Uh, there's no question that when there's people decrying the health of our democracy, Beijing sits back and says, yes, your democracy is a fraud. Our democracy is real. Uh, and uh, when they find people, including the elected president of the United States, saying that we are a country founded on original sin and that we have a lot of work to do and all of that, it just allows their wolf warrior diplomats to parrot American talking points back at us. And it makes the Chinese people think they're stronger than they right. are, that we're weaker than we are, and everyone else around the world, well, these guys are a less reliable partner, right. and so you need to start making deals with the rising power. That, I think, is the most insidious thing. And I think in the last 10 years, they have made shockingly great progress. And the only interruption was the pre-COVID Trump years, where I think Americans were wise to some of this, and we were beginning to turn government policy in the right direction. And we'll need another opportunity to continue that change, because we're 50 years into a bad bet. It will take more work to get things right. right. Well, Steve Yates, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your valuable insights with our audience. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Chuck DeVore with the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Thanks for watching. Righty. All right. That work out for you? Jefferson? Yes. Uh, Thank you, Chuck. <sighs> strain of trying to keep